Hey there, Math 30-1. So today I am going, or not today, I guess tonight, I'm going to record um, the 20 or the 2017 release diploma examination item solutions here. Uh, just let my hair down when I got home. So hopefully uh, it doesn't get in my way so I can see these answers here. All right, so we're going to do the 2017. This is probably, what, probably won't do the 2016 ones, so I may not have enough time. Um, if not, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. The day before the diploma? Who knows? I, I just wanted to do this just because um, I didn't want to um, I'll just give you the answers and keep it slightly difficult. I just tell you how to do them unless you come and ask some questions. That's always a better idea. Come chat with me. Uh, so let's go over some of these. So it might take a couple of hours to do this. Remember, you can always skip through and find the answers to the question that you want. And... Yeah, let's go. So, we've got a graph of f of x here. Kind of looks like a weird little piecewise function. It starts and just continues on to the left there. And then they're going to transform it with these two transformations. So remember, we got a couple different transformations. Remember, if it's outside the function, that's everything to do with the x-axis. It took me a little bit of time for that. So this is all on the x-axis here. So this is going to be a reflection. And this is going to be your vertical translation, right? Vertical translation. It's your k value kind of just sitting out there. All right. So if I apply the reflection first, because that's the order you're going to have to do things in, so you're going to do this one first. Uh, if I do that, I'll just draw this thing in order, what's going to look like. So if I do the reflection first, let's do this in blue here. My graph is going to be something like this. So this point that at positive 1 in the y value is now going to be at negative 1. Positive 1 here. This point here on the x-axis, because this is over the x-axis, this point is invariant at this point. And then this graph will continue downwards forever. Right? So that is, let me just highlight it, that's just the green part. Right? So we do that first. And then, after that, we want to do this plus 4. You've got to do your translations after the fact. So this whole graph is then going to be moved up 4 units. So this point that's on the x-axis now, because that's probably one of the most important points for this one, because I'm looking for the range. I'd like to know what the max value and the min value is. So if I move this up 4 units, and now I'm up here, and all the points get moved up 4 units, like 1, 2, 3, 4... So my graph is going to look something along these lines. I'm not too concerned about exactly where this crosses the x-axis, but my graph will then look like that. So based on this knowledge that the max is 4 and the min is infinity, remember you can never include infinity, um, we're going to go with D because remember you always do your lowest value, so we start with the lowest and then work out to the upper one there. Okay. So I'm just going to put here final. Oops. Final book. Okay, just if you're looking at this, you're like, okay, which one is which? This is the final graph, right? Um, so, now the function fx is drawn entirely in quadrant 2, as shown. So you got to close this. The three functions, three new functions will be drawn after some transformations. So we've got some transformations down here. For each of the functions below, identify which quadrant the graph will completely be drawn in. The quadrant number may be used more than once, once, or not at all. That makes sense, because then there are three answers. I guess we move it out of quadrant four. Who knows? So this one here, we're moving it down eight units. That's a vertical translation down eight units. So if I do that one, I'm going to just take this max here. So this goes up to ten, so this is eight here. So right now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If I move this max point down a unit, it's going to be down here somewhere. So this is going to be 4, and this is going to move down another 4. So I have a point here. This is 4, so somewhere around here. So this graph is going to kind of go like this. Right? Somewhere around that kind of shape to it. So that's, oops, I'm going to highlight that one. So this one's completely in quadrant 3. It's nice that they labeled it for you, but they didn't have to do that. A quadrant three, all right. 
Now this one here, because it's inside the function, is going to be a horizontal translation, and this because the plus 8 is going to move it left 8 units. Well, that's kind of interesting. So if I move it left 8 units, this whole thing is going to move this direction. So my graph is going to be uh, 8 units. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 here to here. And then it's going to kind of go up and then down and back over like this. So it didn't actually move out of the quadrant. So that's kind of interesting. If it moved right, it would have went the other way. But because of the plus 8, it moved left. All right. I'm just going to put here left. This one's down. And this one's going to be a reflection, but because it's inside here, this is going to be on the y-axis. Remember, anything to do with the b-values about the y-axis, so this is going to be a reflection over the y-axis. So it's going to kind of flip this way. So if it flips over the y-axis, uh, let's just color code it. I'll just give this uh, yellow. Uh, then I'm going to have a point that looks like this. Okay, it's going to go down, then up, and then down. So it's reflected in that y-axis. Okay. So that's going to be in quadrant one. I guess we didn't use quadrant four. I'm going to do that of a question, just kind of drawing what happens to the picture. Maybe this left and right one messed some people up. They kind of said they can use it more than once. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Let me just double check. Did we get that one right? Yeah, I think we want to D. Okay. I should, I'm not going to scroll back all the time. So this one here, uh, so we, this is a very typical diploma question where they give you a graph and then they do some kind of transformation to it and it changes some kind of characteristic on the graph. So I want to know what this characteristic does here, or what this stretch does here. So this is a, a horizontal right, stretch of a factor of of a factor of okay, two, okay, and then to complete it, so you should say about the what do we say this one is? This is over the y-axis here, so y-axis, okay. So when you're doing that, you're writing a response. That part is pretty important to some diploma workers, which I don't see why, but that's okay. So we got some zeros. Okay, so right now the zeros of this function, so p of x is zeros at this point, happens to be, because remember what would make this equal to zero make, is called a zero, is that negative three, negative a half, and positive two. So it's nice to put them in order. So if I do a horizontal stretch about the y-axis, anything that's just on the, on the x-axis, that's not zero, right, if it's not on the y-axis, is going to be stretched outwards by a factor of 2, because these are x values, like this point is actually negative 3, 0, right? This point is negative a half, 0, and this is 2, 0. So when I do my mapping notation, x, y, and this is going to affect the x values, it's not going to affect the y values, because they're all zeros, but I'm going to have a 2 on the x. So all these are just two times what they were before, uh, there's no negative, so there's no reflection. I don't see anything there. So it looks like it's just going to be A. There you go. Okay. So we stretch vertically here. We take a graph and stretch it vertically by a factor of a ninth. Uh, they stretch it horizontally by a factor of 7, about the y axis, sorry, and then translate it 7 units down. So they didn't need to use the horizontal vertical translation there. Hmm, I'm not happy with that. Um, uh, these transformations can be described by mapping the notation blah blah. What are the possible values here? So this is this is probably built to mislead some people because the wording, the stretch factor by a factor of one seventh, is literally what you have to do. So when you do the mapping, when I do a horizontal stretch factor of this, I don't do the reflection, right? So that is still a one seventh. Okay? So that one's still gonna be one seventh. And then I do a vertical stretch factor by one ninth. So I'll put that there. And we go down eight units. So the key is that this horizontal one, which affects the x values, stays the same here. If I were to write it in this form, 
right? With the B value, it would be a 7 here, right? And then everything else would be the same as it was, something like that, right? So this reflects, right? But they're asking for this, right? So this in mapping notation and this one in the wording are the, exactly the same. So I'm going to have a reference number 1 for M. That's not going to change. A half, I'm sorry, ninth for the other one, so that's 2. And then negative 8 for 6 here. Right. Well, because it says plus here. So maybe 8. If it said negative P, then we put just a regular here. Right, 1, 2, 6. I'm good. Okay, the next one here. But the function is transformed, blah, blah, blah. And we're trying to figure out how do we get from the first point. So they want to figure out how do we get from here all the way to here. Okay, so now there's a couple of ways to do this. They go, there's only limited options here. Uh, so the first thing, does the vertical stretch factor of 4 do what it needs to do? So yes, that's my vertical stretch factor 4, 6 times 4, right? So my mapping notation, that's what I'm going to be doing. But then the next part says, okay, I'm going to figure out how do I change this to the 7 using the B and the minus 5 here, right? So what this is saying is I'm going to take this value, I'm going to times it by 1 over B, then I'm going to add 5 because I'm going to move to the right, and I gotta get seven. Okay? So if you want to reverse the operation, say I want to go back this way, I can minus five first, and then kind of divide by b rather than or divide or times by b, I guess, to get to where it was. So divide by one over b. So that's my question is what's happening in that spot there. Okay? So if I want to, I could just literally pick some of these and just see if they work. Like if I pick a B value of 2, 1 over 2, that's a stretch factor of 2. So I would times this by 2, which gives me 8, and then add 5 is not going to be 7. So this is not going to be a good one. All right? And then maybe this one here, this B value, this would be a stretch factor of a half. So this would be, I'll write down a factor of 1 half, and this would be a factor of 2. Um, so this one, a factor of a half, so I times it by a half and get myself 2, and then add 5 and get 7. So that would work, right? So you could do that. You could just kind of guess them on the down, because it's not too hard to do. Or if I want to do this one, I can think, okay, where, what would this intermediate point be? So before I added 5, what would be here? So 2 and 24. So I'll, I'll apply the vertical stretch factor as well, okay? So... Before I get here, there should be a 2 here before I add the 5. It's right there. So how do I go from 4 to 2? Because okay. here I'm going to add 5 to get to this point. So what did I do here to get it right? What's this question mark right here? So I times it by 2. So the stretch, or sorry, times it by a half. So this is times by a half. So I'm going to have a B value of 2. Okay? There's a couple ways to do it. Either guess or think logically a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the graph of a function f of x is transformed into the graph of the inverse of the function. Then the invariant points could be... Remember, the invariant points are points that stay the same. Right? So... If it was 0, 2, it probably came from, uh, depends on what variant was on the graph. I don't know which graph. Um, that may be the top of the original graph. If this is the original graph, then it's going to flip. It's going to become 2, 0, so that's not invariant. This flips, it becomes 1, 2. Okay, this flips, it becomes 0, 3. And this one flips, it becomes 4, 4. Now, the wording it says it could be because you don't know what's going to happen afterwards. Maybe there's going to be some kind of the transformations or other kind of stretching. But at this moment, this one stays the same. Remember, when you do invariant or inverses, when you do an inverse function, the mapping is xy to yx. 
right? So they flip their X and Y spots. The hair keeps it disappearing. Okay. Uh, this one here, so we're going to do some transformations. You notice that there's all, like, the 2019 one, the 2017 one, even the 2016 one, there's a lot of transformation ones, questions. So make sure that's solid. Okay. Uh, so this one here, we're doing it about the y-axis. All right, so it's about the y-axis. We're doing a reflection. This one we're doing both. So both the y x and the y axis. All right. And this one is an inverse. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to put a lot of arrows here. So if I do it over the x-axis, which I figure out, okay, so which graphs for different function below for each of the transformations. Uh, do? Oh yeah, the graph of g of x is the same as the other graph. So when I reflect it over the y-axis, which graph stays the same? All right. So this one here is symmetrical about the y-axis. So if it flips over the y-axis, it's going to stay the same. So graph 3 is going to stay the same because it's the symmetry on that one. Okay? It's just the same on both sides. The next one is going to be flipped two ways, right? So it's going to flip on the x and the y-axis. So right now, if I flip two over and then flip it again, it's going to be over here somewhere in the first quadrant. That's going to work. This one, possibly, if I flip it over both axes, and this one, if I pause for a little bit, there's more than one correct answer. So it kind of looks like graph one could be uh, either, or statement two, sorry, it could either be graph one or four. So if I, if I show the steps there, let's just put a light color. If I reflect it over, say, the y-axis first, it will look like that. And then if I reflect it over the x-axis, it's going to look like that, so it's going to be on top of the other one. And the same thing here, if I reflect this over one of the axes, it doesn't really matter which one because it looks the same both ways, and then I reflect it over the other axis, like I flip it here and then I flip that over there, or I flip this one over here and I flip this one down here, it looks like I can have two different answers. Uh, I'd probably go with four for this one. Why not? That's pretty nice. And then the inverse one, now the inverse one is, there's only one answer for this that I can see. That one, remember, that's if you reflect it over the line y is equal to x. If I flip this graph, it kind of just copies itself on the other side. It's very symmetrical that way. So this one would also be 4. I just want to see if there's more than one answer for this one. Numerical response number 3. Yeah, so they could use 1 or 4 in the middle there. Okay. I'm going to put over here. Or one. Right. I'm going to put one of them. Uh, the logarithmic function in the form blah, the logarithmic form of this equation blah is this. So they just like, okay, how do I get rid of the base A exponential, right? Now, depending on the teacher and stuff, it depends who's watching this, and this is probably public on YouTube. Um, there's lots of people that not the ways to do this, but you probably want to get rid of this exponential. So you're going to want to get the exponential by itself first. Then apply whatever rule you have to get rid of this. I just say that because exponential is the logs of inverses of each other, take the log base A of both sides. Okay, so log base A of both sides. Okay, so this one here, look cancel out because they are inverses but or you could use that rule where you drop the three down and log base a of a is one so this will become a three if you want to you could just drop that down to the front and uh i think we have our answer so law uh, it looks like it's going to be b in this one be pretty good so i wouldn't take the log right away you could but then it wouldn't really match any of those because you'll have to separate it and minus it and then put it back together. It still works, it's just a very long way to get around it. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh yes, one of these are typical ones where it's kind of a 
a puzzle where you have to think, okay, how do I make 90 from these two numbers here? So you've got to think, okay, how do I break this up into these two things? So 90 is the same as saying 3 times 3, which is 9, times 10. Okay? And then my log law just says that when I multiply two things together, I can separate them the plus sign. Oops, there should be a base 2 there. And then plus the log. So that's all that really is. Sometimes they throw in some variables in there, but it's the same idea. Now every time I see a log base 2 of 3, I'm going to put an A there. So there's an A here, there's an A here, and there's a B here. Some people can say that's 3 squared and then drop that down, but that works the same way. So we have two A's and one B. So we need that one. Now other ways to solve for A and solve for B, type it in there and see if it equals that other one there, but well, that doesn't matter to me. But well, whatever works for you. Okay, there's a lot of things with this one. Student A, student B, they're both wrong. We just gotta figure out where they made their mistake first. So student A gets pretty far down. Alright, so the first thing they do is they remove this uh, coefficient and they move it up on top of the x. So that's fine. Perfectly fine. Then this next step here, so they didn't do the little intermediate step, but when they're adding two logs at the same base, you can multiply what's inside them, right? So this is log uh, squared, or sorry, x squared plus y, or times y cubed, or why am I saying y? x squared times x cubed. When you do that, you add your exponents and you get five. Perfectly fine. And now this next part is where the mistake happens. These exponents are inside the log, right? So this, this is not like typical brackets. This log is kind of sitting here. It's in the way. So when I put an exponent on the outside here, right? When I put that exponent on the outside, that is outside of the log. It's not inside the log. So there's no way to get that exponent into the log. So the, the power to the power rule doesn't work here. Okay, so... There's nothing I can do after this stage. This 3 is kind of stuck here. All right, this, I can't get this 3 into the log. So this is where this kid made a mistake. Oops, I was going to get a little sad piece there. All right, kind of looks like he's crying green. So this kid made a mistake here. It's like These two steps are fine. Step 3 made a mistake. Okay. Now here, either the kid made the same mistake on that stage here or made it much earlier. And it, this kid didn't make it much, much earlier. Okay. Uh, by this time, you should have done the binomial expansion rule. Now, this is the binomial, because the plus sign is separate in the two, so that's very important here. So when I cube this, it's really, it's going to be a log, so I'll, put, I'll write it down here, plus log x cubed times log x, okay, times log x cubed times the log or 2 log x plus log x cubed. Because because of that, so we're gonna use a rainbow here for the rainbow method. I'm gonna have to do the like the whole rainbow because this plus sign here is kind of messing this up. And if you know anything about exponentials, there's gonna be, because of this, there's gonna be four terms after the rainbow. There's only two here. Where do the other terms go? Like I already have on this one three terms, maybe four terms, because it's four lines. And then you're going to have to do it all over again with the other guy. You're going to do lots of terms. This kid just made a lot of mistakes in the first method. All right. And then they did the same thing the other kid did. They tried to do the power of the power. This exponent doesn't can't combine here. So this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This, this whole thing doesn't work. They just messed this one up. Student B did not do a good job here. So they messed up on step A. Right. Or step one. Okay. Just remember that, like, if it's a binomial, it doesn't matter how complex a binomial is, the x plus y stuff. If it's a binomial and you do the expansion, you're going to get lots of terms. Right? You're going to get, based on the rule, the binomial theorem, you get that many terms. And this doesn't make any sense. You should have way more terms in this. Plus, they also made lots of mistakes with those exponents. Oh, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. So this graph has a vertical asymptote. Okay, each of the graphs have a vertical asymptote because they are logs, right? So remember that 
let's just start off here, an exponential, okay, with a base that's greater than one, that's what they're saying here, looks like this, right? A log is the inverse of that. So you kind of reflect it over, and a log is going to be looking like this. This is a log with the same base, okay? So it's being reflected. It's being reflected over this line. Yeah, I could just draw that on this one too if I needed to. Okay, but I wouldn't. I don't want to do that. I don't want to confuse this diagram. So, in the exponential, we have a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to zero, and at the log, we have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to zero. So now the key part is that this is an x is equal to zero now. Okay. So which of the following have an asymptote of x equals 0? So obviously the first one, because it hasn't moved yet, right? Now the next key part is what is going to affect an x value, right? This is an x value. So pretty much anything to do with b or h, because anything in the horizontal direction, stretching-wise or translation-wise, is going to affect an x value. So... Which ones are going to affect the x value? Because those are the ones that are going to move this value. We don't want the ones, we want the ones that don't move it. So this is just going to affect y values, so that's not going to move anything. So this affects just y values. All right, so the key is I want I don't want this to move. Alright. So uh, this one here affects x values, right? Those are x values. But a multiplication, right? So it times by a half. But what's zero times a half? Well, it's still zero. So that one's not going to change it as well. This one, because it's outside of the log, imagine there's like brackets right here. This one affects the y values. Okay, so that's not going to affect my vertical asymptote. So for right now, we have four. The last one, this is an h value because it's inside. So this is going to affect my x values. And this one's actually going to do it because you're adding or subtracting. You're like minusing two, right? So it's two left, right? So technically you're going to move minus two units to this thing. So this asymptote for this one's actually going to be a negative two. So this one does affects the x value. So there are four of them. Let me do this. Okay. Uh, so what do we have here? So. This graph is vertically stretched about the x-axis, vertically stretched, right, about the x-axis, by a factor of a, where a is greater than 1. Honestly, that doesn't really matter, but that's okay, as long as it's not 1 or 0. Uh, this is, makes it easy to not write two things. Uh, the two characteristics about that will remain the same. So it's kind of the same idea as this, right? If I do a vertical stretch, it's going to affect everything that has to do with y values. So this is an exponential, so that means it has a horizontal asymptote. So in this case, the horizontal asymptote is y is equal to negative 4 because of this little piece here. So it has a horizontal asymptote. I'm going to write that down. It doesn't have a vertical one, just a horizontal asymptote. Remember, these ones only have the one. It's rational expressions that could have both, right? Unless there's a point of discontinuity. Um, right now, its domain of this graph, if I were to write it down, is x, x, er, that's its domain. Its range, which is a y value, is going to be y is greater than, but not equal to, negative 4, y, r. Okay, those are the two things there. It's, I don't know what its uh, y intercept is. We can figure that out, let's put a 0 on here, so it's 9, so it would be 5 apparently. Okay, this is my y-intercept. And it's x-intercept. I don't know, let's just, let's just kind of guess whatever this is, we'll just call that the x-intercept. Right. But the key of the x-intercept, it has a number 0, okay? Now we just want to figure out, okay, so which of these has a y-value that's going to change if I do a stretch factor vertically, because the vertical stretch factor affects the y values. I'm just going to go down here. Vertical stretch factor. 
I'll teach this. It's going to affect the y values. So this is multiplying everything by uh, what a, whatever a has to be. So domain, no, not going to change. Right? It's an x value. Why would it change? X intercepts, no, not going to change because they're x intercepts, right? You know, horizontal stuff will change that. But everything else has a y in it. The range has a y value in it. The y intercept is a y value. The horizontal asymptote is y is equal to negative 4. So all of these, if that was 0, if the horizontal asymptote was 0, then it wouldn't be affected. But in this case, because it's a number and it times it by a, so it's going to be whatever negative 4 times a is. Right? Uh, the two characters, oh, we have two characters in here. Let me just double check. What are we doing here? Oh, what do we do? Vertical stretch by a factor of a. This is f of x right here. My y intercept's going to change. My horizontal asymptote's going to change. That's not going to change. My range is going to change. Do we have more than one answer for this in my response number four? I'm just going to go back here. I like that. What is it? One and three. Let's, let's see why they say 1 and 3. Maybe they don't say why, but 1 and... Th oh! Will it remain the same? Oh, jeez. Never mind, that's probably... That's why I messed that one up. Whew, it's a good thing I was like 3... How do I fit 3 spots in here? The ones that remain the same are these ones. These other ones change, right? Change. 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 These other ones remain the same. So those are the ones we're going to put in there. So <coughs> I should really read that beforehand. Hopefully. Maybe that's why 50% got it wrong. They're like, oh, which ones remain the same? So same. Okay. So, cool. Um, this is a very typical question. This happened on one of the other uh, released items as well. It's all about changing the base in this one. They purposely picked A's and B's. There's nothing wrong if you just want to pick a random A and B, right, and just see what happens. If you want to do that, you can. Okay. Uh, and then test all these X values and see which ones work. Just pick some reasonable ones. So pick like 1 and 0. Obviously, it can't be 0, but don't pick 1, right? 1 to the power of anything is still 1, so that doesn't help us too much. But like 2 and 3 or 5 and 9 or something could work out. But the way they want you to do this question is to make sure the bases are the same. Because if the bases are the same, then it's easy to identify, oh yeah, here, 2 is equal to x, right? So the, then the exponents have to be the same. Or you can take like the log of both sides and fix the problem, right? So right now the bases are not the same, so I'm going to modify this other side first. So they're both to the power of 3, so really you can pull that 3 out here. So that 3 is now going to be sitting on outside of this instead. Okay, so this side's not going to change. It'll just be a over b. Okay, two x minus three. You can practice on that one too if you want to. Um, so you can pull that out. So this will just change into if I were to keep this nice and organized here, three x plus twelve. Now you notice that the bases. This one's b over a, and this one's a over b. So it's not the same, but you maybe want to flip them over. So another thing is that if I had like one over five, I can rewrite that as like five to the negative one. So I can flip them. Okay, I'll put this as a bracket if you want to. Well, it'd be a better example if I actually had a fraction instead. So I can flip this whole thing over and have a negative exponent. So that does the same thing that negative exponent does in reciprocal. Now it doesn't matter which side you do it to, you can do it to. Uh, the left side or the right side here, because I already wrote down this side. I might as well do it to this side over here. So I'll flip this one over, so the match is that one over there. But now I'm going to put a negative one exponent here beside the other one. So now if I look at my exponents, because the bases are now the same, I can drop the bases, okay? and then I can write this out. So I'm actually going to write it out before I multiply the negative into the brackets there. So I'll multiply this negative in. So I negative 2 plus 3, negative 2x, sorry. 3x. 
Uh, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go 5x, and then I'm going to minus over this one. So I'm going to get negative 9, and then I'm going to get negative 9 over 5. Hey, look at that. That's one of our answers. That's nice. Oh, I did not mean to cross it off. All right, so there we go. So I'm just going to key here. You notice that this flips over here, and that 3 kind of comes out there. Yeah. The minimum number of years to, from January 1st that will take the town to exceed 20,000. So it's increasing at a rate of 2.6% per year. Now it's increasing, so the key word here is increasing. Remember, increasing graphs had to have a B value if you were going to write it in this form here. To be increasing, my B value has to be greater than 1. And that's going to be very key. Now, this also kind of relates to a question from the 2019 one where they asked you to find the interest. Because what you're going to have to do to this interest is you have to add 1 to it. So if you wanted to find the interest, you have to minus 1 from it to go back to what it was before. So my B value for this one is going to be 1 plus my interest. Now, it's per year. Everything's done per year, so you don't have to modify this. Like Sometimes you have to divide by 2 or divide by 12 or whatever. The compound period is this is just per year so i'm going to take the 2.6 here and divide it by 100 to get that decimal that's my percent there okay so that's my b value okay the a you remember the a is your initial amount so it starts off with 16,000, and you raise it to the power of p or t over p and because it's per year and i'm not doing anything else to it this is my p my p is one so that's a pretty nice exponent. And we're just going to make this thing equal to 20,000. Okay. Right. So if I do some of the math here, actually I'll just kind of clean it up before I divide anything. 1.026 to the power of t. And we have 20,000. Now did I bring a capital here today? Is that a dinosaur? No, I don't think I brought my calculator with me. That's fine. Okay, I'll actually have this calculator. Cool. Okay. So 20,000 divided by 16,000. Really, that's just 20 divided by 16. It's 1.25. So I'm going to divide the 16,000 over to the other side. Now, you cannot multiply the 16,000 in because remember the rule. You can only multiply things with the same exponent. So this has an exponent of 1. You just don't see it. And this has an exponent of t. So can't multiply them together because you don't know what t is. If you knew what t was, then maybe you could. Ah, I just lost that. Okay, so we're going to divide it over to this side and get 1.25. Now I just have to solve for t. All right, so you could have graphed it. You could have graphed it at any stage of this, actually. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the log of both sides. Now I'm going to pick my log to specifically be the log of the exponential on the other side. Remember, we could always take whatever log you want. I don't really care. Right. I did this one so it cancels out nicely. Right. It's like squaring both sides or cubing both sides or something. You could do whatever you want. You just want to do what, what's useful. So this solves for t, and all I have to do is just calculate this. But depending on how old your calculator is, you may not have the log base button. Uh, I don't think I have it here. Oh, I do right here, my log base button. Okay. But if you do, you can just type it in this way. And 1.25. So it's going to take me about... Or to the nearest year? Yeah, to the nearest year. Because if I do at 8, I'm not going to have enough money. I want to get to the ninth year. So it's actually 8.69... But you're going to round it up to 9 to make sure you have enough money. Now, if you have the older calculators, you're going to have to go like this. You're going to have to go log 1.25 divided by the log of the base that you want this to be in. All right. If you use log base 10, that's what you would have to do anyway. You know, since it's the same thing. So there we go. Cool. This hair makes me look like a student. I know it's taught. Oh, uh, what's this looking for? Oh, it's looking for that zero, that one of the multiplicity of two. Shown below shows that this is a factor. 
and then it wants you to find the other factors. Oh man, this is a this is a longer question. They want you to find out what this B value is. Okay. Now there are two ways to find out what the B value is. You can use the synthetic division way. But because the B value is in two spots, I'm going to use the remainder theorem way. So this is my factor. It says it is a factor. So that means the remainder is going to be zero. Alright, so my R is equal to zero, my remainder. When my zero is equal to negative 1. So according to the remainder theorem, if you put a negative 1 into this equation, you're going to get a 0 out. So whenever I put a negative 1 into here, 3 times negative 1 plus 2 times b, I need to get 0 out, because that's what this is. This is the remainder theorem. Remainder. Right. So my remainder has got to be 0 when my 0 is equal to negative 1. So I put a bunch of negative 1s in there. Let's just simplify this down. Negative 1 cubed is still negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, but times negative 7. So negative 7 there. So that stays negative because it was negative times a positive now. Negative 1 times b is just negative b plus 2b's. Okay, and then I just kind of rearrange this is all for b. You'll see why we're doing this, okay? So I'm not even doing anything down here yet to find out what this other zero is. But this here is negative one if you wanted to know. We're just trying to figure out what this one is. Question mark. Uh, we're just going to rearrange this. So this is a uh, negative b plus b. Two b's is just a b, sorry. I'm going to add over these two things to the other side. Looks like we get eight. So b is equal to eight. Cool. Okay. Now we know what b is. What I do, what I can do now is I figure out what my equation is. I'm going to rewrite this now. So b is just 8. So this is going to be negative 7 squared plus 8b plus 16. Because there's my equation. What I'm going to do to find out what this other 0 is, I'm going to now synthetically divide it. I'm going to factor out the other 0, figure out what that last quadratic is. And hopefully it's a perfect square because you can see it's being squared down here. So I'm going to pull up my synthetic division here. 1, negative 7, 8, and 16. 3, 2, 1, 0. I'm not missing anything, so I don't have to put any zeros in there. I'm going to put my 0 here, and then continue. Now, depends on who taught you how to do synthetic division. We use our zeros in our course, but you can also use your factor. But if you use your factor, you have to minus. If you use your zeros, you add. So I'm using my 0. All right, my 0 both negative 7 here, I'm going to add. So I'm going to multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. So do we get 0, so that's good. So there's our, so it is a factor, so that's this one, so that checks off here. We're just trying to find the other two now. And the other two are kind of hiding away in here, okay? So what's left over, because we factored out one of our x's, is going to be x squared minus 8x plus 16. And then the other one is right here, x plus 1. We just have to factor this last piece. And I know it's going to be a perfect square, because you know this is a tangent. It has a multiplicity of 2. I'm going to write that down. Mult of 2. So it's going to be squared. So it's x times x. Uh, looks like they're both negative 4 and negative 4. So it looks like a is 4. Perfect. A is 4. It's a good sign that this ended up being this way. So this ends up being x minus 4 squared. X. There we go. Cool. Uh, we've got a multiplicity. We've got a polynomial here. It's got a bunch of multiplicities to it. One that's cubic. One that, or sorry, multiplicity of three and one is uh, squared, so multiplicity of two. To give us some information here, this a being less than zero means that it is a negative, right? And then it's just telling about b and c. Uh, they just look like the, because they're both positive, right? And there's minus signs here. That means both of these zeros happen to be to the right. If I were to graph this out. So, this would be like where our two zeros happen to be. They just happen to be on the right side. Yeah, that's fine. Now, because this is negative, it's going to have, and it's odd, that this is an odd graph, because 
take a look at these pieces. That means it's odd, right? Took odd, because they add up to five. So therefore it's going to have that kind of downwards or upwards motion. So it's not going to be like a parabola where it's opening up or it's opening down, right? It's going to be extending from one quadrant to another, going up and down forever. But because it's negative, it's going to start up here and end down here somewhere, right? So this is negative, right? That one's pointed downwards because of the negative. This is pointed upwards because of the odd, right? Because they're in opposite directions. Okay. Now, because of the square and the cube, actually, I don't know what else we have to do here. So this is quadrant two, q2, and this one down here is q4. So this is true, extends from quadrant two to quadrant four. It does not have a maximum value. We're talking about absolute maximum values, not like relative ones. So maximum, it's like those would be like quadratics where they actually have a, a min or max point. So this is, because it's odd, it doesn't have one of these. It has exactly two x-intercepts? Yeah, it does. And it's y-intercept, let's just double check that. So the only way to draw this would have to be, there's two ways to draw this, I guess. You'd have to kind of go through, and if this was the tangent one, this is the multiplicity of two, let's imagine this would be, and then it would have to go like this, right? Because then it has that kind of bend to it. That would be the multiplicity of 3. So that way, or I can have the multiplicity of 3 here and then the tangent. But either way, this always has to be a positive y-intercept. So that's not going to happen. So it's just, it was 1 and 3 already, so I already knew that. So I'm just going to put that down there. Just be very careful of the wording, too. Sometimes it's correct or sometimes it's incorrect. I always think, to say incorrect, I always think that's like the meaning way to do the question or answer the question. Uh, so we have a bunch of zeros here. Negative 3, negative 1, and 2. And they tell you that if I put a 0 in, I get negative 12. It's cubic. Okay, so that, what they're trying to make you do is they're trying to make you make the equation. So the zeros tell us the factors. Right? So if I know the 0 is negative 3, I can say the factor is 3. If I say it's 1, I can say it's negative 1. And if I say it's 2, I can say it's negative 2. So that's our factors. None of these, there's no multiplicities here because it is cubic, and there's three factors. So that's all we have. Right? So this can't do anything else there. But at this moment, if this is my equation, and I did do this, because this point says 0, negative 12, if I put a bunch of zeros in here, let's just see what happens here. 0 plus 3, 0 minus 1, 0 minus 2. I need to get negative 12 out. So what's this going to be? So it's 3 times negative 1 times negative 2. Okay, it's not looking promising that we're going to get a negative 12 out. All right, so I'm making the equation. You'll see why we're doing this in a second. What do we have here? This is 3 times 2. This ends up being 6, but it's positive 6, too. Okay? So I need this to be negative 12. So there must be something here to fix this. So if I do some multiplication and division here, it looks like a has got to be negative 2. Okay, so why did we do this? Well, so now we have an equation for p of x, which is y. Negative 2, bracket law bracket bracket all my zeros now if i put in three halves into all my spots this is a really long question this is a hard question there's a lot of places you can make a little mistakes here like if i just write something wrong in there right so i might as well just pull out my calculator turn the calculator on and just go negative two bracket 1.5 because that's what 3, point, 3 over 2 is bracket plus 3 sorry and then 1.5 you can always use this stox button if you want to it takes practice to use that so i'm just going to type it in 2.25 yeah, not bad that's a pretty nice answer 
So this ends up being 2.25. I guess you could have graphed it and then just traced that x value. They got 2.25 as well. Cool. Okay. Let's go down here. Okay, when, oh, I'm at 50 minutes. Okay, so when comparing the graph to the radical transformation, the dig the square of the graph, what happens to the x intercepts and what happens to the y intercept? So remember when you take the square root, remember this is, it says f of x here and this says f of x. So these f of x's are the same essentially. So what this is just saying is just say, take the square root of the y values, because that's what f of x is equal to over here. It's equal to y. So I'm just taking the square root of the y values. Now if the y values are negative, like these ones down here, that's sad, it's imaginary. They're not allowed to do that. Well, this is the real number system. The same thing with the other side over here. So these disappear. Now that doesn't really help us solve the question. It might help us solve like what's the domain if it asks us that question, but it doesn't, okay. It's asking what happens to the x-intercepts. So when I take this point here, remember taking the y, taking the y values, this value has a y value of zero. So this is me taking the square root of zero, and that stays at zero. So that stays the same. So this point as well, right? Take the square root of that ends up being zero. There's other points in here which you don't really care too much about, like this point and this point, where the y values are one and they stay one, so they don't change as well. But I'm really just concerned about what happens to my x intercepts here. So this one and this one, you know, they don't change. Take the square root of zero, so they stay exactly the same. Uh, the next one I have to worry about here is what happens to my y intercept. Now the y intercept is positive. It's a number, I don't know what number that is. It's slightly bigger than five. Could be anything. But if it was, but it could be like seven, maybe, seven, six. Let's say that's 7. If I take the square root of a number that's not 0 or 1, it's going to be a different number. Like the square root of 7, where is it that color? The square root of 7 is 2 point something. So that's totally different. Approximately that. So it changes. Not the same. So it is different. So it looks like it's going to be C. I guess I can highlight both the different ones here, but the one that matches up here is C. Uh, which of these equations best describes? So this is one of the questions. It was was there a point to discontinuity question on 2019 ones? I can't remember now. But this is nice because it has this point to discontinuity, this pod, this hole in the graph. It's got an asymptote. It's got asymptotes in both directions. Kind of looks like this it could be one. It may not be very important because you know there's no A values down here. Oh, uh, this is at 3, so this is x equal to 3. That's nice to know. What else do I need to know? This crosses here at 2. And this crosses at 6. Okay, so this is my x intercept here. And my y intercept. We have the y intercept one I'll worry about later just to make sure it fits the graph. But we're going to go through all the pieces here. Now, it has a pod and an x or a vertical asymptote. Because it has those two things, these two pods, that means it has two non-permissible values. x cannot be 3 and negative 2. And because it has two non-permissible values, it means it has to have two factors in the denominator. So I'm going to cross this one off. There's just not enough down there. And you've got to make sure the factors match up. Okay, the factors match up for all the other ones. That's good. Now, to be a pod, there has to be a factor on the top and a factor on the bottom that are going to cancel each other out. So like these two here are going to cause the pod because they cancel out, right? And the one that doesn't cancel out causes the asymptote, okay? So I'm going to cross this one off because there's nothing to cross off here for the pod, okay? Now the last part here, this part represents, because we'll talk I'll talk about briefly here too. This represents the x-intercept. The only way to make a rational expression, because to find the x-intercept, you have to make y is equal to zero. The only way to ever make a rational expression equal to zero 
is that the top has to be zero. It doesn't matter what the bottom is, it could be whatever you want it to be, it's a number as long as it's not zero. But for this to ever be zero on this side, the top has to be zero. Okay. So if I want this x-intercept, which is six zero, and I need my y to be zero, that means I have to make sure that the six causes the top to be zero. Okay. So it's got to be d. Okay. It causes it to be zero. Now, another one here, I don't know what that would be. That's like the y to set, well, horizontal asymptote. Could be. Now the horizontal asymptote is defined in this kind of form. We have x is the top and bottom. By the leading coefficients, if the degrees are the same, you divide them. So here, if I were to multiply this out, I would have leading coefficients of 1 divided by 1. And the horizontal asymptote y. And just to double check, is my y-intercept correct? Remember to find the y-intercept, you make x equal to 0. That's also another way to check. Put zeros in here. This would be 1 third. Put zeros in here. Negative 6 divided by negative 3 is 2. So it would match the proper y-intercept of 2. All right, so this one checks off, but this one doesn't. This has a y-intercept of 1 third. That's not good, so I'll cross that one off, right? X there. Okay, let's go down here and see what we have here. So we have a rational expression. They want us to know where the point of discontinuity in is, if there is one, and where it will be. So it's always a good thing when you're doing these kind of questions to factor them out. You know, so I just instantaneously put uh, brackets on that top one there. And uh, it's going to add, multiply that to 2. So the 2 and the 1, it has to add to a positive. Okay. So the one that crosses off, like I said, the one that crosses off is the point of discontinuity. And the la other one that doesn't cross off is your asymptote, your vertical asymptote. So vertical. I'm going to put down vertical here. Okay, so let's see which of these is true. Point of discontinuity. This could be true. This one here, definitely not, because my point of discontinuity is going to be at x is equal to 1. Okay, because what would make it equal to 0? So it's definitely not this one. This is the wrong value here. Okay, vertical asymptote is not at 1, because it's going to be at negative 2. So that's not true. And this is not true. The horizontal asymptote is not negative 2. Actually, the horizontal asymptote for this graph is x, sorry, y, something like that. Ah, so I that. y is equal to 0. And the reason it's 0 is because the degrees here are not the same. So we have that rule. Where if the degrees are the same, you can divide the coefficients. But if the degree in the bottom is larger, oh geez, how do you do that? The degree on the bottom one is larger than what's on the top, then it's zero. If it's the other way, then we have a slant asymptote, and we don't deal with that in this course. Uh, let's see what we have here. So we're taking a graph and we're just multiplying these together. Yeah. So, let's pick a bunch of points here. Now, remember, the solid dot means multiply. Multiply. All right, not composition. That might be like the next question down. Yeah, this one has a composition. So, a hollow dot is a composition. I probably spelled that wrong, but whatever. Now, let's go here. So, I'm just going to multiply. Remember what this is. It is f of x times g of x. Remember, f of x is defined as like y is equal to f of x. And g of x is g of y is equal to g of x. So it's really the y values times the y values. I'll put dots here for that one. But then go across here. y times the y. The x's don't change. I'm just times in the y values. So we take the two y values here. I'm just going to pick a different color. So 2 times 4, that gives me an 8. Blah. Okay, and then let's just keep on going here. Like this one here is going to be 2 times 0, so that's going to be 0, 2 times 0. If you want to do this one, this one is 3 times 1, so that stays as 3, 3 times 1. Kind of looks like it's going down. Looks like there's a maximum value of 8. 
Oh, let's keep on going. Maybe this is going to change. Uh, so if we got 1 times negative 1, so yeah, that's going down. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Oh, here we got negative 2 times 0. Oh, it's going back up. Oh, and now we have a bunch of negative numbers times each other. Negative 1 times negative 3. So that's back to being positive 3. Negative 1 times negative 3, so being back to positive 3. Now, a, a linear line times a linear line is a quadratic. Right? Like if I were to look at these equations, it seems a bit uh, excessive, but if you want to look at these equations, like this equation is uh, negative x plus 4, and the other equation is negative x plus 2. If I were to multiply these together, I get a quadratic negative x times negative x, x squared uh, plus 8 and then in the middle we get minus 6x or so. But the key is it's a positive x squared, so it's opening upwards. It crosses at the x-axis, or y-axis at 8, which we already knew. But it, this is actually just going to become a quadratic here. It's going to go down, and then back up to there. And this is going to go down, and then back up. That's really poor drawing. But then we have here, we have min values here. A min value here. And then min value because it's symmetrical and it looks symmetrical to that point there. So my minimum value is negative one. So actually, this graph is going to be greater than or equal to negative one. So don't don't just half-ass it and just stop halfway and say, "Oh, it's going down." I'm going to stop it's less than eight. It goes back up. You kind of follow the trend. It's quadratic. Okay. Cool. Composition. Okay, so when it comes to compositions, you're putting one equation into another, right? So this is just saying I'm going to take f, or actually I'm going to take g here, and jam it into f. So what that means is I'm going to take g, which is this equation here, and put that into f. It's kind of like saying if I said f of 3... What that means, I'm going to replace all the x's with 3's. Right, I'm going to get 3 here, 2, and a plus 5, right? So I replace the x's with 3's. Here, I'm going to replace all the x's with this bigger piece of whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to take this and replace all of these with it. Right, all these little pieces here. So... I'm going to say this is going to be bracket 2x minus 1 squared plus 3 bracket 2x minus 1 plus 5. This 5 doesn't have any x's on it. So I'm going to replace all the x's with that. Uh, now I just want to see them multiply this thing out. So when I multiply out this binomial, remember, binomials, you're going to get a trinomial because of the exponent. So I'm going to get 4x squared. Okay, so it looks like a is going to be 4. I'm going to get a positive 1 over here, but then you get that middle term, which ends up being negative 4x. I mean, negative 2x plus 2x. Negative 2x. Then I'm going to add here, I'm going to multiply this one into the brackets. 6x minus 3 plus 5. Group our like terms, we've got 4x squared ba, 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 plus a 2x and a 6 minus 3 plus a 3. Cool. They're all positive, that's very key. They're all whole numbers, which is nice. So it looks like I got 4, 2, and 3. There you go. Cool. All right, so now we're getting into the trigonometry section. Yeah, good. Uh, so a typical arc length question. So a leaf is caught between a car's windshield and the windshield wiper. The windshield is 50 centimeters in length. So I guess it's indicated down at the bottom there. It sweeps at an angle of 145 degrees. Okay. Keep that in mind that that's in degrees. And the leaf traces 100 centimeters. The distance from the leaf to the end of the windshield wiper, or oh, that little piece on the end there. So this is very 
it's missing. Like you're not trying to find the radius from here to here, but you, or you kind of are. But that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for this piece out here. So I do need to find out that radius, this R for the leaf, if we were to make a circle here. So using our formula, theta is equal to A over R, if I just rearrange it for R, so that's going to be A over theta. A very common misconception would be to take the 100 centimeters, which is the arc length, and divide it by the 145. But the problem with the 145 in this formula, this formula, this has to be in radians for this to work, right? But this is in degrees, so I'm going to have to change it. So I'm going to set up a little ratio here. Oh, that's not my ratio. Cross that off. Pi is 180. And I'm going to put the 145 there. And I'm going to put my calculator and just do some cross multiply and divide here. So cross multiply, divide. Figure out how many radians this 145 is. So 145 times the pi. Okay. I'm going to divide it by, I should click the button. 180. Cool. Uh, so this is going to be 2.53. So this ends up being a little question mark here. So this is the same as saying approximately 2.53 dot 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 dot. I'm going to say dot dot dot, so I'm going to use all my decimals as possible here because you should always round at the end. So what do we have here? So I'm going to go uh, put it here, 2.53 rads now. Okay. Rads don't have units, but I'm just going to put it there to clarify that it's not degrees. So this makes more sense. If I did if I did the division the other way, it'd be like a really small amount, but that doesn't make sense. So this looks way better. This is about 39.514. Centimeters, which looks much better because that whole thing's 50. And then I'm going to go 50 minus my answer. So 10 point, you want to do the nearest tenth, so 10.5. So I put down here 50 centimeters minus x is equal to 50 centimeters, 39.51. So this is 10.5 centimeters. You can put it in that spot there. I'll just put a box around this answer. There you go. Okay, so here's a point on the circle. What we know about this point on the circle is on the unit circle. Good. So remember that members that keeps the hypotenuse of our triangles one. Might be useful for something else. Well, let's just see what they're trying to convey here. So they're trying to use some logs here. Now, I don't like radicals in my logs, so I'm going to change that to a half instead. Because that's what a square root is. Oh, then I noticed that, oh, they, this can just cross off. Oh, so this is just saying a half y. So if I use my unit circle knowledge, if my x is a half, then my y would be root 3 over 2. Um, it doesn't specify whether or not this is in... Uh, what did it say? No, B is greater than 0. The terminal R draw is standard position of the circle. It could be. So, again, it doesn't specify whether or not this is plus or minus. But at least the X is positive. Uh, this just means that my reference angle my y is the bigger angle, so that my reference angle is about 60 degrees or so, or if you want to, pi over 3. Okay. Then I'm just going to go through and just figure out which of these... Okay, let's go back to my picture. Okay, so it's either in this quadrant here, or it's in this quadrant. That's one of these two. Because uh, it has a positive x value. So it's not one of these quadrants. Okay. And then, so it's either this is pi over 3. This one here is, I can never remember this one, this is going to be 300 degrees. What's that end up being? 
radius here. 5 pi over 3. Okay. Now the problem is none of those answers match here, right? But the key here is that coterminal to my angles, right? So what are some coterminal angles to these? So I'd just be, well, these look like they're bigger, so I'm just going to add 2 pi to every single one of these, right? So this one, if I add 2 to that one, let's go math, enter, enter. Oh, I got 11 pi over 3, so that doesn't match there. If I add 2 to it again, it's 17 pi over 3, so it looks like I skipped over it with that one. Right, so some coterminal angles for this one. If I add, oops, sorry, if I add two pi, I get a eleven pi over three. If I add two pi again, I get what was it, seventeen pi over three. So it doesn't quite match. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm going to add two pi to this one. This is going to be seven pi over three. Okay, that didn't work too well. I'm going to add another two pi to this. Uh, what's that going to be? 7 plus 6 is 13 pi over 3. So there is one of my coterminal angles right there. Right, so it's going to be that one. Cool. So I'm just going to keep on adding 2 pi over 3. If, were there, if their answers over here are negative, I just minus 2 pi over 3. Uh, I guess I didn't have to find this root 3 over 2. But the x value was enough to find the reference angle. Cool. Oh, what's the exact value of these? So again, some more unit circle knowledge. Remember, this pi over 3 is the same thing as 60 degrees. All right. And this here, 5 pi over 6. I'm actually going to go, no. I'm just a bit too lazy. I mentally think about that. It's going to be late. It's 11 p.m. That's 150 degrees. Okay. So 5... 60 degrees on the unit circle, if I go 60 degrees here, this point is now 1 over 2, root 3 over 2. So sine, remember, is the y values. Okay. So that's the root 3 over 2. So it's going to start off going root 3 over 2 in this spot. Okay. Then the next part is going to be squared, but I'm going to do it for... 150 now, so 150 is going to be right about here. So that's this angle is 5 pi over 6 here. So 150. And this point is going to be negative root 3 over 2, 1 half. Okay, now remember this is the x values because it's cos. So the x value is going to be negative root 3 over 2. Okay, so we're going to square that. So that's going to turn positive. So good, so I can probably just cross off these ones because there's a negative in them. So I've got a root 3 over 2, and I'm going to have 3 over 4. So you square the top, you square the bottom. Okay, so we've got a common denominator 4. So I'm going to take this one here and multiply it by 2 top and bottom. So they both have the same common denominator, and then I can add the tops together, and we're going to get, boom, we're going to get that one. And when all else fails, just plug in your calculator, right, match it up to the answers. Uh, just make sure your calculator's in the right mode for that one. Cool. Uh, these are two points on the unit circle. If the origin is 0, 0, which is the center of the unit circle, then the measure of the smallest angle between these two points a O B, which is kind of a weird way to say that. Uh, I, want to, I want to draw it down here. And I'm going to have to draw it down here. I don't really get too much space here. I guess I can use the information or space above there. I'll just use this, then I know this is part of the page break. Uh, so point A is going to be, or oh, it's in degrees. I want this to be in degrees, which is nice. Okay. Nearest degree in degrees. Okay. So I can do my math in degrees. It's always nice to do math. So this point A, A is going to be here. So that's A. And this angle is going to be 30 degrees. It's so the longer side's on the X. And down, so then B is going to be negative 
in the X enough, so it's going to be over here. So that's going to be. Okay. And then this reference angle is going to be 45 degrees, because the two things are the same, root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. Uh, so the smaller angle between the two, let me get a positive, yeah. The smaller angle between the two is this angle on the top. There's this bigger angle on the back side, but that's, you want the smallest, right? The smallest angle between them. So I want this one that's on the top here. So that's 45, so 45 on this side. This is 60 on this side. What's 45 plus 60? 105? So 45 plus 60 degrees. 105. I'm an hour 15. Oh, where am I? Oh, okay, I'm in a pretty good spot so far. I've got a lot of pages here, but... Okay. Hope well, I can get this done by the two-hour mark. Woo! Uh, which of these two trigonometric ratios is actually equal to the reciprocal of root 3 over 2? Negative root 3 over 2. Okay. So, we got to figure out... There's a lot of different ones here. So, let's start with A and just work our way around here. So A, so 7 pi over 6 ends up in, I'm just doing color here, that's 7 pi over 6, and then pi over 3, I'm just going to try to keep this kind of organized here, so pi over 3 is right about here, okay. So pi over 3, 60 degrees is going to be one half root 3 over 2. Now, the problem with that, it's positive. So, this is not going to work, right? Both numbers are positive. I need this to be equal to a negative number. So, this angle is just too small in the first place. So I should have just cross this angle out. Everything was going to be positive here. I'll just complete this though. Uh, this is going to be negative root 3 over 2 and a half, or negative a half. So this one probably could have worked. Yeah, cosine could have worked for that one because cosine is negative, and this is one over cosine. Okay, that's one over cosine, and this was one over sine. Okay. Uh, or I guess if you want to put that in there, one over the x and one over the y for all of us. Okay. So I'll cross that one off. B, let's do B now. Let's see what B says. So B, I have 4 pi over 3. So that's going to be in this quadrant down here. This is blue. I'm going to probably cross this off right away because I already see that my x value is a half rather than being root 3 over 2. So I'll cross this one off because of that. Right? These other ones look promising because they're over 6 over 6. Now these are both the same. There's 5 pi over 6. So I'm assuming that's going to be true. I should just double check that. And this other one, I might as well complete this one. Let's see if this one works. So this would have worked. This did not work. This one did not work. Did the 5 pi over 3 work? 5 pi over 3 would be over here. We would have a sine value, 1 over 2 for the x, sorry, and negative root 3 over 2. Yeah, this one would work because it's a y value. So that would work. So this one works. But this one doesn't work, so I crossed that off already. This would have worked, but this one didn't work. So 5 pi over 3 works, so that means this works. Does 5 pi over 6 work? I'm assuming it does, but let's just double check. Uh, da, da, da. So I'm going right down to D here. It's taking a lot of time for this one question. Uh, so this would be the same here. So check mark that works. Okay, now the 5 pi over 6, that would be over here. And it would have a negative. Yeah, so this looks like it would work because it has an x value of negative of root 3 over 2. Cool. Ooh, that was a fun question. I guess I could just type those in my calculator and see if they hold it. I'm guessing this would have not worked. Okay. 
in order to be positive there. Uh, the number of squirrels n living in a particular area can be modeled by this weird function, where t is the months since emissions began. At five months, the population reached the first maximum. Okay, so I'm going to start drawing this out so I can figure out what this graph would look like. I'm seeing there'd probably be no negative to these, so I can't have negative squirrels. So let's just draw like this then. So five months, and then and at 12 months, the squirrel population is the minimum. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five. So right here, five months. I have a maximum of 200. Okay, so right up there. Okay, at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 months, I have a minimum at 1, 12, 10, so right about here. I'll go over here 1, 10. So right now we have this part of the graph, like that. Okay. Well, I do think they're not asking for C. C would have been more difficult. I guess it would just be like minus 5 if it's a coast graph. Yeah, minus five. Right, so we, we can complete the whole graph. Why not? Uh, let's see what the distance here. So the dis this is only half a graph. So it goes to get back to the crest. That'd be the other half. So the other the distance here would be twelve minus five. So how far apart is this to this one? So twelve minus five is seven, right? So if I go another seven this direction, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to be at my next maximum here. Okay, so this was 12 minus 5 to get that point. Okay? So add 7, this will be 19. Okay, so there's my full graph. That's one cycle. It's going to help us out. Because one full cycle, from here to here, that's my period. So that's my period. And that is going to be... 14. Okay. Uh, so that's good. Now, my midline is going to be somewhere in between here. This is my midline. Remember, that midline is the same thing as my D value. The distance here, or the distance here, that's going to be my A value. So I need to figure out what those two things are because they want us to know the, they want to know the A value. So the total distance here is 90. 90 divided by 2 is 45. Remember, you can always do the max or yeah, max plus the min divided by 2 and the max minus the min divided by 2. Cats are going crazy. Uh, so if I go max minus the min divided by 2, that gives me the 45. And if I go max plus the min, now my cat is going crazy. Divided by 2. This gives me my midline, so 155. I always do both and then I try to figure out which one makes sense. So this line here is at 155. Now I didn't need that, but let's, uh, let's start creating the equation. Okay, so we have our cos, the A value, our amplitude is 45. Our B value, I'll have my D value, I'll put that in there first. My B value is related to my period, so my period is my, it's going to be 2 pi divided by my period to get my B value. So I reduce this down again over 7. So this is going to be pi over 7. And if I wanted to find what the C value is, so remember what a coast graph is this shape. That is the coast graph. But it usually starts on the Y axis. So this graph has got to move over five units that into the right direction. So it's going to be five here. So this is this is a cos theta graph, right? That shape, sorry, max to the next max. So what we were looking for anyway, we were looking for the amplitude and the B value here. Let me get that. Cool. Let's go down. Okay, we got two graphs here f of x and g of x. g of x is kind of looks a little bit squished in. Now f of x has a period of 2 pi. Well that makes sense. The b value has changed. 
It's being phase shift 90 degrees or pi over 2 to the right in the sine graph, which makes sense. And it's being moved up 2 units. So it looks like they both have the same midline here. So I don't know what kind of transformation. So it looks like that. The amplitude looks about the same. Okay. So what are we doing? Okay, sine graph. So we're trying to figure out what the g of x sine graph is. So the amplitude looks the same, so it doesn't look like that's changed. We're using sine. So we have to be very careful of which kind of graph we're using here. Now remember, a sine graph looks like this. This is the part of the sine graph. That's the sine graph there. If you wanted to use the sine graph on the other one, you can. So this part is, that's the sine graph there, right? So that, starting from the midline up, down, up, that's the sine graph. Assume it's a positive A. Um, assuming that A doesn't specify, so we'll just assume A is positive. So we're not going to change A. We have to figure out what parameter actually changes. Uh, <laughs> describe, change can be described as the parameter having a new value of this. Okay, so my B value doesn't change. My D value didn't change. Oh, my B value did change. Yeah, you're right. My B value did change. Oops. So I do have a new B value because I do have a new period. Uh, but my D value didn't change. So that 2 is still a 2. Okay. I didn't ask for that anyway. So this, it's either the C or the D. Now, they both have that same starting point. So they both actually look like they got shifted over pi over 2. So... My C value is still negative pi over 2. You can see that this point had, it used to be here, it's got to move over that pi over 2. And they both have that same upwards motion there, so they're both the same. So it's got to be the B value that changed, but now I just got to figure out what it is. So it's going to be 2 pi, because I'm using radians here, over the period of the graph that we have right now, uh, pi. Two. The period is pi. The B value is two. So be very careful about that too. Might, that, that would throw some people off there. Uh, the general solution. So here we're just trying to solve for theta. So I'm just going to start rearranging this. You might as well. So let's minus that over. Ooh, that negative is very important. Now because it is negative. That means it's not in the first quadrant and it's not in the fourth quadrant because cos is negative in these two quadrants here. Now remember, cos represents the x value on the unit circle. That means the x value is going to be the longer side here. So this point, if you actually wanted to know what it was, would be that point and this point here. Okay. So that represents a reference angle of 30 degrees on both sides. Now, there we go. We just have to find out what those two angles are. Actually, we want to find the general solution. There's two of them here. So I just have to find the principal angles for both of these. I'm going to cross this one off and this one off because they're in the wrong quadrants already. Uh, this one's in the correct quadrant. This one, yeah, these are all in the correct quadrant. There we go. Now, they're over the 30 degrees. Remember, this is pi over 6. So that means my angles have to be pi over 6. So this is probably wrong, too. So the only one that actually could be possible is that one. But if you want to find out what they are, you can. Pi, pi over 6, that makes sense. Okay, so let's see. All right, which of these satisfied this equation? Okay. Now, a very common mistake here is to say, oh, I'm going to just divide both sides by sine, and that's it. But that, by, by doing that, you remove one of your values. You're kind of getting rid of some values there. Because zero could technically work. Whatever would make sine equal to zero would work. So I wouldn't do it that way. Because it is squared, I'll leave it as blue apparently, I'm going to add this over, make this equal to zero. Then I'm going to factor it. Rather than dividing the sine out, I'm going to factor 
the psi note. So I get this. So we have two things we have to solve for. We've got to make sure psi, when is that equal to zero? Because of this piece here. Right? And then for the other part, when is sine x equal to negative a half? So sine x is equal to zero, because remember this is the y values. Uh, when is y is equal to zero? It's equal to zero here and here at these two points. One, zero, and negative one, zero. So at a zero and 180, zero, 180, zero, 180. Um, I do want to include, I don't want to include 180, so not including. It's also not one of my answers, so that's good. Not including. But this means include, right? So I could have negative 180 as well. So one of my answers would be negative 180. Actually, this is going to be right here. It's probably going to be D. Zero as well. Actually, that just gives it away. That's going to be it. But this other one here, let's just double check. Does this other one have the other answers? So sine is negative in the bottom two quadrants. Sine is a half. It's the opposite side, so that means it's going to be 30 degrees in this side, 30 degrees, so pi over 6 here, and pi over 6 down here. That means they're over 6. Um, yeah, so you cross all of these ones off because they're not over 6. Cross this one off. I'm um, just left with B or C, but I already decided that this one is the case because these ones actually are solutions, and these other ones are too. Maybe that makes sense. Because I want to measure into the negative realm here. So this answer and this answer are my two answers. The negative direction. Okay. Uh, which of these equivalents? So we're gonna pull out our unit, or oh, I don't have that with me. My formula sheet. Oh, let's see if I can find my formula sheet. Actually, I have no clue where that's going to be. Is that down here somewhere? Ah, oh, right in map. Ah, oh, sweet. Okay, good, good, good. So I'm going to use my identities over here, so I'll just zoom into that spot. So let's pull out my equation. So we're going to do the sine difference and the cos sum identities here. So in my sine difference identities, it's sine cos minus cos sine. So this is going to turn into sine pi over 2 cos that minus cos pi over 2 sine. Yeah, I think that's what it said. Let's just double check that. Sine alpha cos beta, sine alpha cos beta, yeah. Minus cos alpha sine beta, yeah, okay, looking good. Then I'm going to add cos, uh, cos sum. Cos sum is, if I remember, cos cos minus, cos cos minus sine sine, yeah. So this is going to be cos pi over 2 sine theta minus, minus, if I fix that, minus uh, sine pi over 2 sine theta. Oh, this is weird. Sine theta. Okay. Now, the pi over 2 part's the really easy part here because pi over 2 is not just a point. That's straight up at 90 degrees here. And that point is 0, 1. So using our sine being the y values and cos being the x values, this will be 1, this will be 0, this will be 0, and this will be 1. Okay, so because these other ones are 0, they cancel out, they're gone. 0 times that, 0 times that. So I'm left with just these two things in the front. So I'm left with a cos here, 1 times cos, and then I'm left with a minus sign over there. So that would be this one. Okay. So it kind of just simplifies down to just those two things. Put the minus on here. Cool.
Seems pretty easy. Well, where are you going? I should probably double check my answers on this one. That's fine. Uh, yeah, very common mistake here is to take the cos and divide it by the sine. But remember, for that to be true, you have to divide both of these because you can separate them. You can go 1 over sine. You have to separate them first. Plus cos theta, 2 theta over sine 2 theta. So this is what you would have to do if you wanted to try to reduce this down. Because cos over sine is cotangent. Right, that is a cotangent. But this is not 1. So I'm going to cross these two off, right? So this just doesn't make any sense. So that doesn't work. So I'm just going to write down here, not 1. All right? Very important. Okay, so that didn't work. So i got to figure out some other way to fix this. So you notice that the other two answers, they just don't have... Uh, The other ones just don't have those double angles. So I'm going to want to get rid of the double angles. So the only one thing I could do about the sine is that the sine identity says 2 cos theta, or sine theta cos theta. If you look at that, the only one. So sine 2 alpha has just that one option. 2 sine alpha cos alpha. So that's the only one I can use there. But the top one, the cos 2 alpha, so it's going to be 1 plus. So ignore all this stuff here. Let's put this here. Ignore this. It just didn't work. Right? This part here has two options. Okay? Or has three options, doesn't it? So it's either one of these ones. You have to decide which one's going to be the best for us and which is going to work the best. Now, because of the one, I probably want to get rid of it. Right? That's a positive one. So I'm just going to look at one of these and say, oh, this one has a negative one in it. So one minus one would end up being zero. This other one has a 1, and be 1 plus 1 to get a 2. Not oh, impossible, it still work. This other one just looks weird, I wouldn't use that one. So I'm going to use the, what is it, the 2 cos squared alpha 1, so I'm going to use that one. So it's going to be 2 cos squared theta minus 1. Okay, so my next step after this is I'm going to cross those off, and I'm going to have 2 cos theta, okay? Then I'm going to start simplifying that down, because everything here is just multiplication. So I'm not going to run into the same problem we could have had with the other side. I can just cross those twos off. I can cross off at least one of those coses. And I'm left with a cos theta over a sine theta. And according to my identity sheet, cos over sine is a cotangent. So this ends up being A. There we go. So that worked out. Oh, now we're into perms and comms. Oh, we're reaching the end here. This is awesome. So we have very particular four-digit bank code. The first and last digit must be odd. The second digit cannot be a four. Digits cannot be used more than once. Cannot be. I'm just going to highlight that. Now to determine the total number of different possible codes, the student shows the following calculations. So what would you put in each spot? Uh, first digit, second digit, four. I didn't say anything about what digits you have to use, so I'm assuming we can use all ten digits. So half the digits are odd, half the digits are even. So if I were to just start here, I could put down. Oh, it's not too well. Uh oh, my thing is kind of freezing up on me here. I wonder why. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. So, half my digits are odd, so I would have five choices for this one. And then the, if I use one, if it cannot be used again, then I have four choices for this one. So these are my odd numbers, and I have four, five and four choices. Now, if I've used two digits, I have eight left over, but this digit cannot be a four, not equal to a four. So, I've already used two odd numbers, but those are not even four is not an odd number, so that doesn't affect anything. So I have two digits gone. I'm going to get rid of the four. That means I only have seven choices here for this number. Okay. But the next digit can be a four again. 
So even though I took out the 4, and maybe I used this digit, I could put the 4 back in. So now I still only use three digits here. So I have seven digits here for that one as well. The rest. Oh, this is really... Oh, no. Did my thing stop on me? Oh, no, it hasn't stopped on me. Okay, good. I hope it hasn't stopped on me. But I am having problems here. The rest. I just hope my thing is not freezing up on me. Yeah, so this time it's an hour of 40. Ooh, an hour of 40. Okay. Uh, for a picture, three girls, four, or three girls, three boys are arranged uh, such that they alternate. Now, this one's kind of tricky because uh, we're looking for arrangements, so order does matter. So there are two cases here. One where we start with a boy and one where we start with a girl because the alternating pattern could go boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, or can go girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, right? So we've got two cases we had to deal with, so we could just find one and times by two, or just find the two and then add them together. So for the boys, we have three, two, one, three, two, one, and for the girls, we have three, two, one, three, two, one. Okay, so if I do the one calculation on the top, I'm going to get uh, 9 times 4. I'm lazy. So do that. 9 times 4. So I get 36. And then I'm thinking, okay, I need two of them. So that's times by 2. So it's actually 72 for this one. Okay. Cool. Uh, just be very careful. Like, Watch out for repeating letters, but Verify doesn't have any repeating letters, but if it did, you have to make sure those are accounted for. Here's a, a number of six letters. So six letters is all the letters, which the letters E and R are next to each other. Okay, so E and R. What I'm going to do is I'm going to treat E and R as one letter, and then all the other letters, like V, I, F, and Y, so there's the other four letters, they're going to be treated as their own kind of little block as well. So here I have five blocks. So this here can be rearranged five factorial ways. Right? But E and R can be switched. Right? So this can be rearranged two factorial ways, so two ways. So I got five factorial, which is 120, but there are two factorial ways because I can switch my E and R. They don't have to be ER, it can be RE. So there's 240 ways to do this one. There you go. It says it's not necessarily in that order, so that's very key. So I can switch them. There you go. Pretty easy. Now, how many ways can they be apart if I added that question on there? So just remember that you can do this now since I have the information about them being together, and there are six letters. There's six factorial ways of them being together. I'm just going to quickly calculate what that is. So that's 720 ways that these letters could be rearranged here, right? If I didn't have any restrictions about E and R, this is the total number. Now, to find the apart, I would take the total, the 720, and I'd minus the 240 from it. All right, so that's my math for this one. Because I knew them being together. So if I wanted to find out when they're apart, that'd be 480 ways. Ways. E and R are apart. Right. It's not one of the questions, but whatever. Uh, oh yeah, this question, this is a funny question. Mr. Rattan is creating some intramural thing. He's got three divisions. None of the teams play against each other, so really, you don't have to do anything. You just got to add whatever these are together. There's five teams in here. There's five teams here and five teams here. They have to play each other once, right? So they don't want too many games to, to coordinate here. So each of these is going to be 5C2. 
So this ends up being 10 plus 10 plus 10, so that's 30. 30 games. Because they play a game against each other, it doesn't matter what order they initiate the game, you just need two of them, there's only five teams. So each division, there's only going to be 10 games. And you can probably write them all out. But they, each they don't cross over to each other, so it'll just be um, 10 each. That's it. Okay, a committee is being selected from a group of 15. Da, da, da. We want at least one teacher. One teacher, at least. Or sorry, at most. At most. Okay, so that's the maximum number. So I can't go any higher than one teacher. So how many teachers do we have? So we have six teachers. And I want one. Or... I don't want any. I don't care about them. Right? But I still need three people on my committee. So I have 15 students. I have to fill out the rest of the committee out. Right? So I'm just going to do the math for both of these. So I know that 6C1 six is 6. I know that 6C0 is 1. So I'm just going to stick with those. Now these ones I'm just going to have to figure out. So 15 math. Is that one? That's, uh, we're doing C, so number three here. Two. Cool. So that's 105. And then I do the same thing. I just go up here and select that and just change that to a three. So this is 455. So I'm going to add that to six times 105. So 1085. Add those two. There you go. Sweet. Getting the answers. This is kind of nice. Uh, in the expansion of this, the coefficient of the fifth term, okay, so term five means that my k value is going to be four because I want these things to be the same. So what k value do I need to make that happen? k plus one, four plus one, so k is equal to four. Okay, since I know that, I'm going to go 10C4, x to the power of 10 minus 4, so that's n minus k, and then root of 3 to the power of 4. It's kind of nice, because it's even. It's going to help us out with our answer. It's the nearest whole number. Okay. Um, so I just have to find out what 10C4 is. I can just go up here. Yeah, I can go up here and just do this and just change these numbers around. I've got 4 here. 10c4 is 210. Okay, so this is 210. So that's going to be part of my coefficient. It's going to be x to the power of 6. Not part of my coefficient because that's my variable. And then the root of 3 to the power of 4, that is going to be 9. You can go through the math and figure that out. So 9 times 210 is 1,890. 1,890 x to the 6. So I'm looking for that coefficient. And there it is. So it's 1,890, which fits nicely in those four boxes. For a five, I don't know what it would have been. Would it have been too big, maybe? Okay. Uh, the middle term. So people are thinking, oh, how do I have a middle term if I have six things? Well, I actually have seven terms, right? Because of that, we have seven terms. You always have one more than the exponent. So if I have seven terms, it's hard to do this with my hand there. Where's the middle are going to be? Three on each side, so it's going to be this one here. So that's the one, two, three, four, term, so I'm looking for the term 4 here, okay? Now, term 4 means that my k value has to be 3. So I'm going to have 6c3 a squared to the 6 minus 3 a cubed to the 3, okay? So what is 6c3? That's 20. Okay, so that's good. So at least I know 
it's not going to be these 15 guys. This is going to be a squared to the power of 3. And this is going to be a to the 9. So I'll do that one right now because power to the power means you times them. So this one's going to be a to the 6, power to the power, a to the 9. And then when you multiply things with the same base, you add their exponents and you get 15. Ah, sweet. There we go. Perfect. Hey, look at that. We're done. That's awesome. Hey, we finished under two hours. So hopefully that helps you out if you actually watch this video to the end. And I'll see you in class or I'll see you in the next video. Like and subscribe. Bye.